Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. I'm your host, Paul Hanafi. And the topic today is rapid terraforming with 3D printed mold. As you may or may not be aware, uh, 3D printed tooling is a cost-effective way um, to produce goods in low volumes, um, while 3D printed terraforming molds can be used to create parts ranging from um, uh, orthodontic parts, such as retainers, to consumer goods. But how do you get the most out of these processes? Well, here to explain. Actually, I've got some great guests on the stream with me today. But before we get stuck into the meat of today's webinar, let's just go through some housekeeping rules. So um, if you've not managed to find the Q&A tab, it's that big one on the right hand side that you can see there. Um, if it's the first time that you're on one of our live streams, I'd just like to point out there's actually two boxes. Uh, the one for the chat is for general comments. Uh, the one for Q&A is, as the name suggests, for questions and answers. So if you can um, pop your questions in there for us, we'll get our guests to answer them later on in the show. Um, you also get the opportunity to vote um, questions up or vote them down. So you get the chance to, to maybe not double up on something that other people have asked and get your question answered more quickly. Um, this webinar is actually brought to you by Formlabs, a US-based 3D printer manufacturer. Um, speaking of, one of our guests today, um, Juliet Com is an application engineer at the company, while the other Martin Smith is a senior technical support manager at Formeg. So without further ado, I'll introduce Martin and Juliet, who will talk you through rapid terraforming, if I can say it, uh, with 3D printed molds. Application engineer at Formlabs product team. Um, my job is basically doing research uh, on uh, application for manufacturing and engineering and um, working closely with users and industry experts um, to, to develop workflow with 3D printed parts. Uh, I will be uh, co-presenting today with Martin Smith and uh, I will let him introduce himself. Hello everybody, Martin Smith here. I'm a senior, senior technical support manager at Formec. I've been with Formec for about 15 years. Uh, my background is industrial design and also um, manufacturing in the vacuum forming uh, industry. Um, hopefully we can help you today. Thanks, Martin. Very excited to be presenting with you today. So the agenda for today is um, I'm going to start about giving some context about rapid tooling for low volume production. And then I will explain the workflow of using 3D, print, 3D printed mold for thermoforming. I will show a few user stories and then I will hand the floor to Martin for uh, best practice from Formex or uh, industry experts. And at the end, we'll have a Q&A session where you can ask questions to both of us. All right, so just uh, let's give some context about rapid tooling uh, for low volume production. Uh, I would like to very quickly introduce the process on thermoforming. Uh, I have also a short video to, to show. So thermoforming is a set of manufacturing processes that heat and form sheets of plastic onto a tool. Uh, so you can see on this video uh, the type of part that, I was making, that are being done. Um, here is the mold being placed and then the sheet of plastic installed is being heated and um, vac vacuum formed afterwards. Uh, it is a widely used process to uh, manufacture plastic parts and the range of application goes from disposable food and medical packaging, consumer goods and appliance, uh, but also heavy duty applications such as automotive component or inter interior train parts and so on. So you can see some example of parts in this video from Formic. And traditionally, uh, tools or the tool or the mold that are uh, being used for thermoforming are fabricated from uh, by CNC machining metal for large production or wood or composite board for smaller batch such as foam or, or fiberglass boards. Um, this process requires expensive equipment, CNC machining, cam setting for uh, and machine op operation as well. Um, outsourcing the mold takes um, a few weeks and can be quite costly. So it is usually used for a higher volume of production. And the question is, uh, how do you do if you want to produce limited quantities. If you look at this graph, um, if you look at typical steps for product development on the Z axis um, and then versus the technology that is usually available on the Y axis, 
Um, it starts on the left with early concepts and early prototypes, and usually designer will use directly 3D printed prototype. Uh, and then it ends, the product lifecycle ends at uh, production with mass production using traditional manufacturing methods such as thermoforming. Um, but uh, what, what goes in the middle, there's, there's not many solutions for um, producing series of prototype or producing um, limited series of end use parts. So one way to bridge this gap is by um, using 3D printed mold, what we call rapid tooling. And that way, a product designer can produce tools rapidly, as the, the name says, uh, so that um, they can do functional prototype using the final material, uh, so that they can validate the material and the design. Um, they can also use it to do affordable pilot production with hundreds of prototypes. So quite a large amount of prototypes that are either being tested in the field or uh, being tested for certification and so on. And then they can also do on-demand production with limited series of end use parts. Just a quick intro about Form Labs for those who don't know us. So we are a designer and manufacturers of professional 3D printing solution. Uh, and desktop printing is really a powerful tool to fabricate tools rapidly and at low cost because it's easy to implement, um, it's easy to operate and maintain, and it's also come with a complete ecosystem. You can see on this picture our SLA ecosystem. We produce the hardware, software, and materials. Uh, so it's uh, very easy to, um, the, the learning, learning curve is very fast. And this requires limited equipment and allows you to save time on CNC machining, save skilled operators as well for other tasks in the meantime. Um, so that really allows you to produce tool rapidly and introduce that in your product development process to bring a product faster to market. And I mentioned the, the picture before was our SLA ecosystem. SLA uh, also stands for stereolithography. It is a great choice for molding uh, because it is characterized by a smooth surface finish, a high precision that will be rendered from the mold to the parts. Uh, it also facilitated the molding. And uh, prints from SLA are chemically bonded. Uh, and they are fully dense and isotropic, so it produces functional parts uh, with a very high quality. We also have high performance material in our SLA library that can withstand temperature and pressure uh, that are typical to thermoforming, especially high temperature. All right, so now let's dive into the workflow of how to use 3D printed mold for thermoforming. I will here give a highlight of the basic step and then Martin will later on give more in detail recommendation on how they've done it in-house at Formmec. Uh, I want to mention also that we have just released some uh, technical content, a white paper, a quick start guide, and also a um, table gathering different feedback from customers so that if you, are, uh, if you want to reproduce this application, um, this should help you step by step and give you some good recommendation. So first we have in the white paper, we have uh, guidelines on how to design the mold for thermoforming. It is pretty similar to designing a mold, um, a traditional mold for thermoforming, uh, but you can also incorporate, for example, additional air vents that will help to have a stronger vacuum. Uh, and this, is, can, this can be directly incorporated in your design, in your CAD design. So this is one of the great benefits of 3D printing. Um, we recommend having a mold that is hollow and with ribs that will um, help rigidify the, the mold, but Martin will, will go into detail with that a bit later. Yeah, regarding 3D printing, uh, we've, uh, we've had customer working with a lot of different resins. Um, there are uh, three main resins that can be used. Um, among others, but for draft, draft resin is one of our material that is printing uh, the fastest in our SLA library. And so that will be the preferred one for low number of units that you need to iterate quickly if you need to produce a prototype quickly. Um, it has higher layer height than our other resin though, so you will have um, a bit less uh, resolution. 
Um, if you want to move to gray resin, then you will have a smoother surface finish and it's um, more appropriate for intricate details, um, but still for a low number of units. And then the third uh, choice, um, the rigid 10K resin, is, uh, has thermal resistance as well as another resin called a high temp resin that um, Martin has also been used. And this one can handle high temperature. So if you are doing uh, production, um, sorry, condition close to production with very short cycle time with high temperature, thicker sheets um, and a high number of units, then this is the resin that will be uh, the most suitable. As mentioned, we gathered um, uh, feedback from customer. So this is a resource that you have available on our website, uh, and we can also um, uh, share it afterwards. This uh, this is basically sharing uh, different materials that has been used, that has been formed, and how many cycle has been done with one mold and so on. It's not it's not readable really on the on the slide now, but I just want to show what type of asset is available. And from these different feedback, I just want to mention that um, the kind of takeaway from that is that we have been, customer has been testing different material such as HIPS, ABS, PC, PTGP, PP, so a couple of different type of material, a couple of different thickness as well, 0.5 millimeters to 4 millimeters. Um, the sheet temperature can go very high as well, up to 200 degrees C. And uh, in terms of mold failure, um, we've most of our users have tested um, without seeing any mold, mold failure. So up to 50 parts, but without even seeing the mold that breaks. So we assume that we could do much more hundreds of parts, most likely. I just want to share a couple of user stories that have uh, tested this application with 3D printed mold. So the first uh, user I want to mention is a research center called IPC. They are expert in uh, plastic processing. And they've been, they've been also doing some previous work with, with Farm Labs on injection mold as well. And now the latest project was to test um, 3D printed tool for thermoforming. They have been um, thermoforming sheet of IPS, HAPS and ABS uh, of three millimeter thickness, so quite thick for automotive parts. And it worked very well for them. They they were doing about 20 parts, but they didn't need more, but the, the mold didn't break in their test. So you can see the part here. It's also interesting, they incorporated a, a lot of different design features, such as engraved details, some draft angles, some sharp edges. Um, so you also have all the details in the white paper. One point in their study is that they added uh, cooling channels to decrease the cycle time. They wanted to test in condition close to production with short cycle time uh, and, and also like running a lot of part at the same, like in the same time. So to maintain and to monitor the temperature of the mold, they added, added cooling channels. This is a pretty big part. It was printed of our, on a from 3L. And the cooling channel really helped to maintain the temperature of the mold to about 75 degrees C, something like that. And this is a picture of the mold that is being um, installed on the plate. And on the right side, you can see a thermal a camera that they were using for monitoring the temperature. Another example is a company called Glassboard. It's an engineering firm, and they've also been using a 3D printed tool for diverse purpose as well, injection molding and also silicone molding. And they've been testing, they've been using thermoforming uh, mold, uh, 3D printed mold for thermoforming, sorry, um, for diverse uh, projects, um, some uh, consumer good prototypes such as helmets, but also just some, uh, this picture or just some uh, bulk that are being tested and they print with draft uh, when they need to be fast and iterate quickly. Sometimes gray, gray as well and they've also been um, testing rigid 10k. Um, this is um, yeah this is so this is the picture that you can see of the of the mold on the left. And the final uh, example is Lush Cosmetic that has been also using 3D printed mold to thermoform some uh, plastic parts that are then being used to mold soap. So this is also an interesting case. Now I want to leave the floor to Martin, who's working at Formec and uh, he's an expert in this industry and he will guide you 
through the process um, of so through the project that they've been doing uh, at Farmec with 3D printed mold. Okay, hello there, everybody. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, I think it's got some images of uh, the parts that we produced. So you can see in the, in the picture here, we've got some tooling, gray tooling. We've got uh, vacuum formings that have come off the tooling. And now those vacuum formings are going to be high impact polystyrene in the, the blue material. And the white material is uh, 1.5 millimeter ABS. Um, so we were approached by Form Labs to try and test out some of their resins, the latest uh, resin that they'd recently introduced. Uh, we had a Form 2 and we also had a Form 3L. So we were more than happy to, uh, to see what we could do with these new resins and just to see, you know, do they really fit into the sort of the vacuum forming market? Um, can they seriously be considered as an alternative to the, the conventional tooling methods, which might be machining aluminium or tooling board or wood, uh, plaster Paris even? Um, we wanted to make a good assessment of them in, in a sort of professional manner. Um, so let's go on to the next slide, uh, Juliet. If we go on to mold design, what we put together was a, a very simple tray, uh, a bit like a, a desk tidy. Um, it was only about 200 millimeters by about 160 by 42 millimeters. Um, I needed it to be fairly small, so it didn't use up a, a lot of resin. And it, I also, it had to fit in our little oven. So that's why I made it to that particular size and mostly the ability to um, cure it after we'd uh, printed it. Um, but you can see from the drawing there that we had uh, three walls uh, across it and then a, a thicker wall front and back. But it was important that um, we had those walls uh, to, to prove just how rigid the material or how, how rigid it wasn't. You know, if, if the material suddenly became flexible, we'd find out during our production run. So the wall thickness was about six millimeters at the top and each wall had about a three degree draft angle on it. Now at the front and back where you've got the logos, they were a bit fatter. Um, so on the inside, they would have three degrees, but at the front, it was more of a, of a sloping front and sloping back, where we had Formic logo and we had uh, Form Labs logo on the other side. Now, these logos were is really just a bit of fun just to see what definition we'd get and whether we could get nice, um, form, the, form the detail quite nicely. So we only went to about just under half a millimeter in depth or in relief. So it actually stood proud and we were forming over that. I mean, the main purpose of this test was just to see how strong the material was. Um, so we put the logos on and it turned out quite nicely. Um, on, the, uh, on the underside of the tool in that bottom picture, you can see how I put a grid into the, the tooling design. Now it was just purely to um, reduce the amount of resin that would be required. Um, I thought it might also reduce the amount of time it would take to print it. Uh, but that grid also gives it quite a bit of rigidity as well. It tends to stiffen it up because um, we just didn't know how the, the different materials would react once we started the production run. So I wanted to make it, give it a fair chance of, of, um, of coping with the heat and the vacuum that's going to come under during um, a few hours of, of vacuum forming. Now on the underneath there, you can see those little pads I've got. I've got, um, now that is either for applying a, a double-sided foam tape. So if you're just doing a small run of maybe five or 10 vacuum formings, then the tool doesn't need to be necessarily bolted down or screwed down to the, the bed of the vacuum forming machine. So you just simply put double-sided foam tape on there, stick it directly down onto the table, and that should be fine for a small run. But it, as we were doing a run of 50 vacuum formings in the different uh, tooling resins, we decided to to screw those down. Uh, we screwed into those platforms where the, where the tape would go. Um, and we only went in probably five or 10 millimeters at the most, and that was sufficient to keep it uh, nice and uh, firmly attached to the bed of the machine. Now, another thing that we wanted to do was to try and put the, the vacuum holes. With vacuum forming, you have to have vacuum holes to evacuate all the air. So once you've heated up your plastic sheet, You've brought your tool up into the sheet. You've got voids in, under, on the underside that you have to evacuate the air. So that's why you put vacuum holes into all the corners. And these holes are only one millimeter probably in diameter. Um, they need to go in all the corners and also along some of the, the long lengths as well. 
Uh, and then we also added the vacuum holes to the, the actual logo. So it wasn't a vacuum hole for every letter, but I may have had maybe five one millimeter vacuum holes in each logo, uh, especially where you've got the letter O in the formec, you can easily get uh, air trapped in there. So I put definitely put one hole in there to pull that vacuum out, uh, to get rid of the air, to make sure that the sheet got the definition around that logo area. Uh, so doing the vacuum holes in the model, in your 3D CAD model, is a lot easier. Than, well, I think it's a lot easier than probably trying to drill it out later on. It does depend on the material that you're using. If you're using the draft resin or using the gray resin, then you probably can drill it out quite easily. But if you're using a, a harder material, such as the, the high temperature resin uh, or the uh, rigid 10K, uh, then I think I would, I would recommend that you try and put your vacuum holes into the CAD model. Um, and then the, the material size that we used, we used a, quite a, a large-ish machine. I mean, it has a, about a two foot square forming area, which is about 620 by 646 millimeters. Um, but we're only small, uh, forming a small vacuum formed part. So what we do is to use a reducing window, which enables you to use a smaller sheet of plastic on a large machine. And that applies to, to most vacuum, definitely in our range, all of our machines will accept a vacuum, a reducing window to enable you to use a smallish piece of plastic. This means that you're reducing the cost, you're reducing the amount of wastage, and then also you, you can, with vacuum forming, have too much material so that um, you get webs, a buildup of material on the corners, excess material. So a smaller window, keeping it fairly tight, means that you're reducing that risk of um, the possibility of excess material building up and creating webs. But um, if we go on to the, the next slide, uh, 3D printing and assembly. The time it took, um, I, it, it was roughly in the region of probably 18 to 20 hours to print these off. Um, I just went with the, the standard settings that came with the machine. I didn't have the time to experiment. Uh, to I just simply aligned the tool how I thought, yeah, that looks about right. I tended to use the wizard uh, just because it seemed to be the easiest way. So I didn't refine or reduce the number of supports or increase it really. I just, I just went with whatever the software said with Formlabs. And I must say, it is, it is user-friendly. Yeah, anybody can use it, I think. Uh, I was really impressed with it. Um, and even when you upload your model to... Uh, it'll correct if it's got any any problems with the model, any little pockets, even though I thought they were perfect. I mean, they still found issues with it and the software within Formlabs managed to clean it up, which was great. So that, that gave me peace of mind. Um, now with the Form 3L, you've got, your, you've got two lasers that help to create this 3D printed model. Uh, and, and you've got a four, you've got a line, a laser line running through the center, which is it's quite a, a subtle thing. But depending on how you uh, present your model or put your model in the uh, in the printer, that will determine where that line occurs. So what I did, I tried a few experiments. Um, like you probably can't see it on that bottom picture there, but there was a faint line running across it where the two li uh, laser lines uh, intersected. Um, so then I tried another one, just simply tilting the model up on its end and putting it just over one of the, the real laser. And that got rid of the laser line altogether. But if, even if you do have a line, uh, I did find that with all of the resins, you could sand it down uh, to get rid of, it, rid of it if you want. But just to be aware that there is a laser line and you need to find the best way to um, angle your tool or your model before you print it. Uh, bearing in mind where that line is going to occur. And also you've got to bear in mind where your support structure is going to be as well. Because, you know, at some stage when you've finished off your print, you're going to have to remove your support structure uh, and it'll need a little bit of cleaning. So you need to put that probably on the area that's not going to be quite so visible if you can. Um, cleaning up was fairly straightforward. Uh, compared to the Form 2, I, I don't know whether it generates more heat on the 3L, but uh, it was a bit harder to sort of get it off the, the base plate. Um, but I did, and then removing it, uh, removing the actual support structure was straightforward like any other print I've, I've done before. Uh, actual mounting of the tool, you can see in the top picture there, I've used machine screws. So that was for the, the harder resins. So you've got your high temperature resin, 
and you've got your rigid 10K resin. And we just found it was, it could be more brittle. So we tend to drill a hole and then drill and tap into the actual tool and then use a, a machine screw. But with the bottom uh, tool you can see there, that's the gray resin. So for that, we'd use a, a twin fast wood screw. And we just used, uh, I think it was about 3.5 mil diameter. So we just drill a pilot hole of about three millimeters and that would just grip it sufficiently to hold it nice and tight without sort of cracking it or, or causing any problems. Um, but definitely that, that we found that was the best way of holding. If you're doing any production run with a vacuum forming tool on a machine, you really need to secure that tool down. Um, so you, you really need to bolt it down or screw it down in some way. We, we purposely didn't do it from the top because uh, you'd see the visible uh, screw heads or bolt heads. So that's why we always did it from the bottom of the board. And then the baseboard, the plywood baseboard you can see there would then be secured onto the bed of the vacuum forming machine. Uh, the actual baseboard you can see there has a, a sort of largish um, vacuum hole underneath it in the center, which may be 10 millimeters, 20 millimeters in diameter because you've got to be able to draw all the, the trapped air from within that tool uh, down through the little vacuum holes that you've put into the model, uh, down through the, the vacuum hole in the board, and then that links up to the vacuum hole in the, the table on the machine, on the vacuum forming machine. So, I mean, what I also tried to do was to make sure that that tool was down flat on the bed of the baseboard or the bed of the table. Uh, normally you would have it raised up about half a millimeter or so to allow the vacuum to flow. But in this particular case, I knew it was going to be a 3D printed tool. I didn't know how it was going to react. So if you can get it so that that tool is flat on the bed, but still allow channeling underneath to allow the vacuum to flow, which of course you can build into your model when you're doing the CAD, uh, then that's a really good way of doing it. So that the, the plastic, when you're forming it, you don't want it to get round it, and to tuck underneath the actual tool, because then it could lift it off. So make sure it's nice and flat onto the bed if possible. Okay, if we go on to the next slide, Juliet. So here you see a couple of pictures. On the left-hand side, you've got our 450DT, which is a, a typical desktop machine. And then on the right-hand side, we've got our freestanding or floor-standing machines, which is a Formex 686. Now, um, we do a whole range of machines, anything from these sort of entry level machines right up to uh, semi-automatic, large format and fully automatic machines. So the largest machine we do is an eight foot by four foot machine or 2.4 by 1.2 meter machine. Um, but we, we, we cover the whole range. But I think our niche, what we're known for is this, this, this sort of manual semi-automatic machines and then also just getting into the, the more automated equipment as well. The, uh, the 450DT you see there is used a lot in schools all around the world, but especially in the UK. Uh, it's a very versatile machine. Uh, I'd recommend it. It's got four heating zones, so you can control your forming area. Your forming area is 430 uh, by about 280. So you've got a decent size. You can also use reducing windows and that machine to use smaller sheets of plastic. It has its own integral vacuum pump. You don't need compressed air. So you just need to a 13 amp plug to plug it into the wall and you're away. It, it's a very user-friendly machine with a little PLC uh, touch screen on the front for saving memories. The 686 is really, a, it's a scaled up version of the 450 DT, but it's got a lot more power, a lot more heat, a larger vacuum pump, um, a pneumatic table that goes up and down to make it a bit easier if you're using larger tooling, which might be quite heavy, a more industrial fan. Uh, but these are the, the more sort of manual machines before you get into the semi-automatic machines and the uh, fully automatic machines that we produce. Right, the results we got from the 1.5 mil HIPS and ABS. Uh, so the, we did three runs, one run in gray resin. We did a run of 50. We did high temperature resin, a run of 50, and rigid 10K resin, a run of 50. Um, the benefits, I mean, I must say we we're really impressed. Uh, clearly, the, the, the high temperature resin and the 10K resin did stand out, um, but the, the gray resin also did, uh, did a nice job. There was a bit of flexibility in the gray resin tooling 
after maybe 10 or 15 vacuum formings or maybe a bit longer. But I wanted to replicate a typical production cycle where you're doing a continuous production for maybe two and a half minute cycles uh, without stopping. I just wanted to sort of uh, carry on forming until the tool just gave in and it didn't give in. So we were cooling the, the vacuum forming with the cooling fan on the machine, but this was the same way that we would do it if we were doing aluminium tooling, we're using aluminium tooling, or tooling board or any other type of wooden tooling. We want a continuous production. Uh, and that was, so we got actually lovely results as all three. Um, but I would say that the, um, I was really impressed with the high temperature resin and in, especially the rigid 10K. I think because the, the quality of the print was so crisp, I thought, I looked at it and I thought immediately that would be great for chocolatiers and people who want very, very fine detail. But not only that, the, the rigid 10K, the, the actual tool didn't move. We tried, we got it up to 70 degrees and uh, it was fine. And I think it would withstand up to 90 degrees centigrade. Um, and I was really impressed. And then later on, we redesigned it uh, to make even thinner walls of only three millimeter wall thickness on the actual tool. And we did a few pulls, but we just knew, we didn't even finish the 50, run of 50, because we were so confident it was going to withstand the, the test of time you know, in production. So going back to the benefits, you've got rapid design changes, which I think a few of us have mentioned already. The ability to just change your, your model um, in the CAD, at the CAD stage and then to quickly get it onto the machine, print it overnight, uh, and then you come in in the morning and uh, hopefully you've got a, a lovely result there. Yeah, I mean, you could even just maybe print off a small part of your tool to see how it's gonna come out. You know, if you don't want to spend the time printing off the entire tool, um, and don't forget that if you want to make bigger tools, you can always put print off four and put them together. Um, whether you use like a, a jigsaw arrangement to put them together or you bolt them together or bond them together, you've got quite a few options. Um, so you've got the very fine detail, which was especially noticeable around the, the logo, as you can see on that form lab. I mean, you're looking through there through 1.5 millimeter material. So imagine on the underside, it's, it's a lot crisper, the, the detail. Uh, and of course, you've got the benefit of putting your, your vacuum holes in the model. Uh, especially, I don't know how easy it is to drill vacuum holes in the um, rigid 10K resin. I'm sure you can do it with the high temp resin, but that's got glass filled um, beads or whatever it is in, in there. So I think it might be quite tricky. So I'd probably recommend you put um, the vacuum holes in the model while you can. Righty, um, I think we've just cut Martin off a little there, but um, thank you so much for the insight, Martin and Juliet. Um, if we can get Juliet back on stage, I think she's waiting backstage for Hi, it. Paul. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I, I can't see you yet, though. So um, if you just give yes. you a little switch for us. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm sure that our audience appreciated it, too. Um, how are you doing? I'm very good. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks um, for hosting. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, so as you, I'm sure you can see, we've already built up a few questions in the Q&A. So I was wondering if you'd uh, be willing to run through them with me. Yes, sure. Absolutely. So uh, if we start from the top, perhaps, I think Georgia got in first. Um, and it's something that I noticed as well. You ran through some of the differences between the materials there. Um, Georgia asked, what are the pros and cons of using rigid 10K versus the high temp resin when it comes to theraforming molds? Yes, so as Martin explained, actually, he has tried both uh, and he will recommend Rigid 10K for uh, creating more units, so a, lower, a higher number of units, uh, because high temp resin is quite brittle. So in general, I will always recommend going for Rigid 10K when there is high temperature and um, a lot of cycle to, to produce. Uh, high temp work as well, but it will perform a bit uh, less. Okay, interesting. Um, and uh, Nicolo asked, um, how do they compare in lifetime versus metal parts? So cost per unit of produced parts at the end yeah. of resins, that's what he asks. Yeah, so we have tried up to 50 units and the mold didn't break. So we probably 
go up to hundreds of units. Um, this is for low volume application though. This is uh, not to do, in, to do mass production, um, but seeing how the mold was, uh, like the, the state of the mold after 50 iteration, uh, we, we believe that you could go easily to hundreds of units. Um, so what sort of application would you be talking about? So we talked a lot about consumer goods earlier and that sort of stuff. Um, so um, in consumer goods as an example, would you say be able to go into the hundreds there? Uh, yes. So if you need to either to do limited series, um, but I think the, the most used application would be to do series of prototype and pilot, uh, pilot production. So you need to do like probably hundreds of prototype for, um, for this use case. And then there's, I, I also saw that there's also a question about dental application. So for that one, this is also like a big uh, application. We have a complete guide and a complete um, dedicated team for dentistry. And I will actually post that in the chat, the, the link to the dental guide so that you can see. So dental application is a bit different because you usually need to iterate only once on the on the, the, the mold. So you don't have the question of mold lifetime. Uh, but yeah, this is definitely a um, very popular application for dental farming. Sure. And um, I, I, something I picked up on you, uh, uh, something that you said earlier in your presentation, uh, you mentioned some difference between thicknesses of materials. Um, how does that affect um, how the end part performs? The thickness of the, um, uh, the of part the of geometry? Part. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So in, in general, we will recommend for designing the part to respect the rule for additive manufacturing. So we have some guidelines on design on um, avoiding really thin parts. And um, for example, rigid tank K perform a bit um, less for thin wall. Uh, actually, this is an, an example where high temp resin will be a bit better for very thin mold and very fine details. Um, Although for thermal farming application, I think it's usually a bit larger parts and uh, most of the application are not looking for very intricate details. But if you're looking for that, you might choose high temp resin, actually. Okay. Um, and I think we've got, um, George has popped up with another question in the chat. Um, so she asked, how do you recommend measuring uh, the temperature of the tool and all the plastic sheet? Yeah, so we have um, customers that are using camel, uh, thermal camera to, to measure the temperature. Um, this is actually a good way because it's it, like the, the heat transfer will um, be slower in a plastic mold. So that's why you can actually form a very high plastic sheet on those 3D printed molds. Uh, but it's important to understand what is the temperature of your mold because it can do, can't uh, go as high as a metal mold. So usually we have customers that use thermal camera to be sure that um, the temperature that go doesn't go too high. And then in between they use cooling either with compressed hair or they use cooling channel as well for thermal farming. Uh, I think I've, I've, so I've uh, shown in the presentation the um, use case from uh, IBC, a research center that are using cooling channel. And this helps monitoring the temperature. Okay, and uh, what sort of um, issues can come up if the temperature does get too high? So if the temperature of the mold gets uh, high, it's, um, it's going to be more brittle and the mechanical property and the pressure will just break and just the, the material may as well expand and the, uh, and the heat. So you will have some sort of cracks and thermal expansion, uh, expansion at, the, at the surface of the mold. So you can either see thermal cracks, um, thermal expansion at the surface, or it will just crack under pressure. Uh, not ideal if you're uh, if you're using it for prototyping. Yeah, exactly. But I haven't seen that in thermal farming. Actually, I see that more with applications such as injection molding. Okay. Um, and um, something else that Martin mentioned in his presentation, obviously he's not here to, to, to answer, but um, maybe I can put it to you. So you mentioned that um, sometimes you get kind of buildup that can occur in the in the mold and um, Formlab software helped him get, a, get around that in... in the way that you, they use your technology. Um, how does the software work? How does it do that? Uh, so the software, so it's called Preform and it's a software that help uh, preparing the prints uh, in particular uh, for the orientation of the parts and uh, 
uh, placing the support as well because with SLA technology you need to have supports. And what is important is that for any molding application um, such as thermal farming, you should not have any support on the molding surfaces. So that's um, very important because once you have the support, you need to take it off and then you can send it to really uh, reduce um, uh, as much as possible the mark of the support. Uh, but it's much better if you don't have support on your molding surfaces. So yeah, yeah the, the, the print preparation software help you to orient the path to have the best optimal orientation for success for printing. Okay, thanks for that insight. Um, keep the Q and A questions coming in, guys. We're running a little bit dry. Alino's run through a few questions, but I think they were very much aimed at Martin, who isn't here. <laughs> I don't know if you can speak to any of those, but um, yeah. Um, beyond beyond the questions, um, I, I actually had a question about the uh, the white paper that uh, you raised earlier. I think Annie from um, Forbes Lab dropped it in the chat earlier. Could you talk us a little bit through? Um, how the white paper came to be and some of the background there? Yes, sure. So uh, the white paper is gathering, it's basically organized in um, two parts. The first part is a method and guidelines that uh, we put together from feedback from users. So the users are as shown in this presentation, so for May, but also this research center IPC, uh, another user grasp board and all the tests that we have done in-house. And so the first method is, uh, the first section is really giving method on how to design, how to print, how to choose the right material, and uh, how to optimize your process to uh, increase the longevity of the mold and have the best results. So for example, you will have information on, I saw a few questions that are very specific to design, so such as what is the diameter of the vacuum hole? So in the white paper, we recommend from 0 0.5 millimeters to 1 millimeters. Um, I believe Farmec was using 0 0.5 millimeter or, or 1 millimeter. Um, there's also recommendation on draft angle. I also see, I've seen a question about that. So as much as you can, uh, draft angle will, will be better. So minimum two to three millimeters, but if you can do more, it's even better. <laughs> so you have all this kind of information also, um, some sort of design feature to incorporate just to facilitate the, the process. Okay, and if you found that um, it's really um, facilitated new customers adopting a technology recently using these guides and, and do you find that it's kind of made the technology more accessible? Yeah, I mean, so we, we just launched it um, very recently. We launched it um, last month actually. So people are uh, actually very excited about it and very interested in asking a lot of questions. Um, and I hope this white, white paper will help people to to do it and to be successful at it. Okay, hope, ho hopefully uh, hopefully you're right. Um, yeah. So um, there's, 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 there's always one question off the grid, but Jer Jerry asks, would it be possible to mold the human body as a whole? <laughs> there's, always, <laughs> there's always one. Uh, <laughs> would it be possible to mold the human body as a whole? Um, well, so you would like to scan? Uh, I mean, you can do, obviously, you could do uh, scanning and then printing it. So, but we have limitation in the size of the printer. <laughs> but we have two sizes of printer. One that is uh, um, our core printer that is um, for a smaller size of unit and then we have the farm free L that is five times the dough volume and I think this is quite um, suitable for packaging application but also automotive application and so on um, so yeah I guess that would be the limitation of the, the size <laughs> well I don't how, think we're going to see it anytime soon are we <laughs> <laughs> sorry Jerry um, so yeah um uh, something else that I picked up from from Martin's presentation. Sorry to be firing all these questions at you. I'm sure um, Martin's very busy. Otherwise, we would have got him on as well. But um, you mentioned kind of the the benefits of of using things like drill and tap screws to hold the the, the part in position on the terraforming machine. Is that something that you think that customers will adopt more moving forwards, or is this just something that um, specifically made sense for Formic? Uh, no, I think this this makes sense. Um, most of all of our resin can be drilled, can be tapped. Uh, but one thing I want to mention is that 
the benefit of three D printing is that you can incorporate that in the design. Uh, so you can actually incorporate the um, uh, fi fixture hole, and this is actually what Formex was doing as well. But um, when you you can have less, you have less accuracy on um, dimensional accuracy on a three D printed than on a machine metal mold. That's for sure, and that's something to be aware of. So you might want to groom it afterwards and just arrange like do some quick drilling on your on your hole to have the perfect uh, dimension so i i do recommend to like maybe just groom your your print afterwards to have the perfect uh circle hmm, okay so we might see more of that moving forwards um mm -hmm. so um as i mentioned guys you've still got some time left so do keep getting the the questions in on the q a um lena who's a very uh, keen contributor today has Pops another question in for us. Uh, so they ask, um, um, has there been any, any exploration in negative terraforming? AKA uh, yes. vacuum forming. AKA, sorry? Uh, reverse vacuum, for vacuum forming, if I can say it. Uh, yes, we have, I think Formic actually have done both. Um, are, are you talking about, uh, I'm just see seeing a, a comment. Yeah, negative, negative terraforming, I think she calls it. Uh, actually, I'm not aware of that. Um, okay. We, I mean, we have um, we have experience with pressure forming and uh, and vacuum forming. I don't know if Formic has uh, tried any negative thermal forming. Well, it might be one that we have to pick up with them uh, mm -hmm. later on. Uh, we do have a networking session. Um, after the event, which I was going to bring up later on, but I might as well bring it up now. So um, there might well be somebody in the audience that has um, some knowledge of the, of, of the industry or knowledge of, of some of these applications. So do stick around afterwards um, if you're looking for a bit more insight there. Um, mm -hmm. So as I'm sure you can see as well, Juliet, uh, Mark dropped a question in for us uh, based on what Martin rounded his presentation up on, um, that you mentioned that uh, a chocolatier could benefit from the technology. Um, and that he says he has aims for a chocolate mold, although undercuts and finishing of model material pr prove problematic. Um, is this something, is this an area that you think that uh, your technology can help in? Yes, so it can help, but um, it would be to uh, 3D print the pattern and mold, um, then the thermal from the mold, um, because in terms of food safety, there might be some some issue with this, but we yeah. have example of um, printing pattern and then vacuum forming the mold on top of it. Okay, so there's potential there, but obviously the cross contamination risk with food manufacturing mm -hmm. yeah. adds another factor there, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, we don't have any um, food safe material certification on our on our materials. Okay, all right. Well, thanks for 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 Chloe marking on that one. Um, I, actually, I had a question for you regarding the uh, regarding the end of your presentation. You you skipped very quickly through uh, an application of the technology around Lush. Uh, tell us a bit about how they they adopted the technology because that's not obviously from the usual dental kind of um, applications that you you might see it used. Uh, yeah, so I mean, actually, we have a few different cases of um, of company usually in general product designer that will be exploring um, mold making. So any, any type of uh, uh, to make soap, this is definitely one of the, the applications that we see a lot. And Lush was doing that in their product design process. And they've been just creating that to make custom, to make some series of custom soap. And they were just doing the, the pre free printing the pattern, vacuum forming the path, and then pouring um, the they soap into that. So it was actually a very cool project that they, that they were doing. And I think this can be really uh, applied to a lot of different products. Yeah, I think sometimes, um, you know, when you have an application off the wall like that, it kind of, it's, it's, it's attention grabbing, isn't it? It might, sometimes it opens a mm -hmm. new potential bag of applications. Um, Neil actually is asking yeah. in the, the Q&A more about um, maybe a more traditional application of technology. Um, so he says, uh, how could the technology be used um, in the production of car parts, such as things like bumpers? Yeah, so the, um, um, the case from IPC, this research center, was the, it was like a test path for automotive. So they actually made up for one of the 
partner that I wanted to verify that you can do that for automotive. So they were actually using the molding condition close to production usually used in the automotive sectors. So this is definitely something that can be done for automotive parts. Okay, interesting. Sorry, he's, he's commenting in, in real time. Well, well, Lino says there might be a size limitations to that. Is that something that you uh, subscribe to? They can print up uh, the head. So she says there might be size, size limitations to that. Uh, size limitation definitely can print uh, up to the size. Numbers. Yeah. Uh, so you can, can you can you repeat? I was reading yeah, the no. question in the same time. It's fine. It's fine. Um, so I think um, maybe they're just um, pointing out that there might be some size limitations to, to things like automotive parts. Um, do you think it might be better suited to maybe other kind of smaller automotive parts or? Yeah, exactly. It can be used for small automotive part, and for sure the farm free rail will be the right printer to use for that. Uh, you may as well print it several parts, actually. If you really want to print something big, you could have um, printed in several parts, then you assemble. Um, that works also well. We have some customers doing that. Oh, okay. So some, some customers we might hear more about um, fairly soon. Yeah. Um, well, let's see if we can give more more detail. But uh, yes, we have uh, we've had some customer doing it. Okay, fabulous. Um, I'm. Mm -hmm. I think our Q and A is running a little dry. I mean, is there anything that perhaps you you, you want to add about the technology that I've not asked you so far um, about um, kind of potential moving forwards? Where do you see it being applied moving forwards? Uh, so actually, I just see a question about someone asking more info about injection molding applications. Oh, so great. maybe I can um, I can just talk a little bit about that as it's related and definitely more complicated. So we've also been doing a lot of work on injection molding, a similar type of study with a gathering feedback from different users. And we put it together in a white paper with design guidelines and different case study. And we also have um, a table that gathers different molding conditions that user um, have been doing. So this could be a very good reference if you're interested in injection molding to see what type of material has been used with 3D printed mold and what type of temperature and pressure can be done. Uh, but so far, we have pretty good results also for low volumes, uh, so about hundreds of units. Um, this is also the same sort of application doing series of prototype or doing just a few prototype to test the final material and to test your design before committing to uh, investing into a metal tool. Um, and um, we have, obviously, there are some materials that are much harder to process than some others. Um, polypropylene, TPE, PEs, those ones are very easy to process and you could uh, easily expect hundreds of parts from them. But material like uh, polycarbonate or some charge uh, polyamide, for example, those ones are a bit difficult. TPU as well are a bit difficult to process. You can do a couple of parts depending on the mold geometry. Um, so it, it's very dependent on the part that you will inject because a 3D printed mold is quite brittle, uh, fragile, and uh, some geometry may break off more easily. But this is a, definitely a very interesting application if you are in the plastic processing uh, industry. And if you are just producing some product and need to prototype, you also have solution for a desktop injection molding that is quite interesting and using some small injection molding machine and free printing the mold. So we have a whole page on our website for injection molding. So you can have a look at, have more information, information find the webinar, white paper and some with more, more uh, guidelines. Perfect. Thanks. I think that's uh, definitely something worth checking out if, if, if our audience members haven't already. Um, so I think we're, we're just getting towards the end of the session, but I'm going to squeeze one more question in from Georgia. Um, so um, she asks, uh, do you recommend sanding the bottom of the mould um, in these scenarios? I mean, she does direct it at Martin as well, but I don't think he's around at the moment. Uh, this is, if it's the, the surface that is not being um, um, moulding surfaces, I don't see the use, except if you need to fit it into something. So if you have a board that you want to fix into inside. So I'm actually thinking in 
injection molding is more common because you fit your mold into a metal frame and you often need to uh, sand the outside to really uh, have it uh, fitting in the frame. Uh, for thermal farming, I don't have any feedback from users that have been sanding it, but yeah, it really depends on if you need to fit it to the board or to a frame. So it depends. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> it really always depends on your the machine that you're using and the, your setup. Okay. All right. Well, um, as I mentioned, we are coming to the last few minutes, so I think we're going to have to, to leave it there. But um, once again, I apologize for those of you that were with us here earlier. Um, we had some technical issues that meant we started a little late. Um, but I appreciate you all joining us. Um, most of all, I appreciate you joining us, Juliet. Thanks for your insight today. Sure. That was a pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, so the video will be made available for replay if you missed the start or if you'd like to share it with colleagues later on via the 3D Printing Industry uh, YouTube channel. Uh, for those wishing to continue the discussion, as I mentioned earlier, I will be having a network session. So do stick around um, if you want to get involved in that. Um, and yeah, I'd just like to finish by saying thanks again to Martin and Juliet for joining us today. And thank you everyone for joining. Um, we'll see you again soon.